present moment. Take a moment to reflect on that. Powerful, powerful. So where did this ancestral journey begin? Where did it start? A lot of time, we've been taught to believe that our history began in slavery. These lies and miseducation have persisted for a very long time. We've been taught that Africa was undeveloped, primitive and backward, and that we didn't contribute anything to the world. And when you hear that, you understand why some of our people don't want to be seen as African. They don't want to relate because they don't see it as anything positive. And it's interesting when you do, how your posture changes because you recognize that you are part of a great people. Okay, so we didn't contribute anything to the world. Is that true? Absolute lies. Well, it all began in a place called Alkebulan. Africa, our motherland. We were born free citizens, self-determining, self-sufficient, and custodians of nature. And I'm not saying we didn't ever disagree and had our little fights. All families do, okay? But we were self-determining. We were on our road. We built thriving civilizations in places like Kemet, Sudan, Mali, Ethiopia, and lots of other places across Africa. The truth uncovered by numerous historical scholars like Ivan Van Sertema, present day Robin Walker. I mean, there's so many scholars that have actually studied the history of Africa and too many to mention. Before the imperialist capitalist colonial project started in Africa, we were on our own development path, okay? If we focus on Kemet for a moment and think about 4,000 years ago in Kemet, you know, what were we doing? And Kemet, by the way, is not in the Middle East, just to clarify that again for people, although I'm sure most of us know that. You know, when you have a thriving civilization and everything is amazing, what do Europeans do? They don't like us to understand that that is part of Africa. So let's draw, redraw the line. Well, actually, it is Africa. So we know that Africa, Kemet in particular, has a rich history of contributions to the world across many, many fields. And again, many of you know that um, Africa, um, Egypt actually did some amazing things. And I'm going to remind you a little bit of some of that. So Kemet was an advanced and very successful civilization. What do we think was responsible for its success? A few things I'm just going to mention come to mind. So we need to understand the Kemetic psychology, how our people in Kemet used to think their worldview, the way they saw the world was totally different to a Western perspective. Their values and principles which guided their behavior, again, was very different. Their way of life was underpinned by a system called Mahat. Has anybody heard of Mahat? Okay. The, the system was based on the principles of law, order, justice, and balance, okay? So cultivating these principles into their daily lives led to a successful life and community, a community that weren't at war. They weren't warring. You know, you can't build a civilization. You can't really do much if you're at war. So there was a lot of peace because of these principles that they cultivated. They took it really seriously. This is about from birth, we inculcate into ourselves these principles that ensure that we grow into well-rounded, well-developed members of our community, our society. It's not about uh, just about me and what I need to do for me. 
It's about how do I fit into this collective and this community? What's my purpose? How am I going to serve? So that's where they were coming from. Okay, so I'm going to just talk about some of the contributions now. And remember, these were our ancestors, okay? Never forget that. This is where we are coming from. There is greatness built into us. But you know what? A lot of us don't know that. We are very powerful, but we don't know that. Okay. So let's start with medicine. Ancient Egyptians were pioneers in medical practices, such as surgery, dentistry, pharmacology. They developed treatments for various ailments and injuries and documented their medical knowledge in texts. And as we know, many of that was stolen. And some take the credit, others take the credit for the work and the foundation in terms of medical science. Okay, but you know, when you do the work and you study, you know the truth. So you know who you are and where you're coming from. Then we look at architecture. So Egypt is renowned for its architectural marvels, notably the pyramids, which stand as enduring symbols of ancient engineering prowess. The Great Pyramid of Giza is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. How many of you have been to Egypt? Put your hand up. Okay, I've still, I've still to go. It's on my list. <laughs> okay, we might go together then. <laughs> Science. Egyptians were sig made significant strides in astronomy, mathematics, and engineering. They developed calendars based on astronomical observations and devised sophisticated methods for construction and irrigation. Then we have the Egyptian writing system. How many of you were told that Africans were just oral people? They never wrote anything down, okay? Right. So hieroglyphics is one of the earliest forms of written communication. It influenced later writings and provided valuable insights into ancient Egyptian color and history. And you know what? When I look back at what the ancient um, Egyptians did, when, when you go into the um, pyramids, for example, and I've only seen pictures, but you see the hieroglyphs and you see the, the visual pictures, pictorial representations on the, the wall, and I think to myself, these people are amazing because everyone can understand images, okay? Start talking about writing. That's about selectivity. That's about a hierarchy. That's about so certain people having access. They're just amazing. This is about everyone. So if you can understand the pictures, you understand what's going on. I think that's amazing. Art and culture. Egyptian art with its dis distinctive style and themes has left an indelible mark on global culture. From monumental statues to intricate jewelry, Egyptian art reflects their reverence to the creator, pharaohs and afterlife. Now, just mentioning this, you know, when they say we never did anything, we didn't contribute to history. Why is it, and I want to use a stronger word, but I can't because I'm in this church building, why is it then that all of the museums are full of artifacts, of art, of statues, you name it? I don't, I don't even think the museums can put everything out. If you go behind the scenes, there's a hell of a lot stored there. You know, the British Museum, you name them. So we didn't contribute anything? Okay. Trade and commerce. Ancient Egypt was a hub of trade, facilitating the exchange of goods and ideas across the Mediterranean and beyond. Their economic activities contributed to the development of commerce in the ancient world. And also, by the way, Africans did travel to other places around the world. Way, 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 way before Europeans even set foot. Okay, but it wasn't about um, adventures of conquering, it was about enlightenment and passing on what they knew, okay? Overall, Egypt's achievements continue to fascinate and inspire people worldwide, shaping our understanding of history, science, and culture. And that is just one area of Africa. There are many, many other civilizations, by the way, 
okay, right from the south all the way up. Because, you know, we like to kind of cherry pick Egypt, Egypt. But honestly, there is so much that we have done um, and that's been uncovered. So I encourage you all to do the work, to find out more about your history. We know at particular stages in history, we were impacted upon by foreign invasions and the greatest impact ever, the Mahafa. The, that was called the great disaster. The centuries long enslavement and murder of our ancestors, which we are still reeling from today. Yeah, we have not recovered. We're on the way. But you know what? We have to do the work in order to recover. So in closing, honoring our African ancestors is essential for understanding our roots and acknowledging the strength and resilience that has been passed down through generations, recognizing that our history predates slavery and encompasses rich civilizations and cultures across the African continent. In a cru it is crucial for reclaiming our identity and understanding our place in the world. It's like re rediscovering a lost part of ourselves and reconnecting with our heritage to build a brighter future. You know what I liken it to? Suffering amnesia. One day you just collapse and then you wake up and you're like, okay, so where am I? Who am I? Where did I come from? Don't tell me that every human being or individual, you wouldn't do that. You want to know where you're coming from. You want to know. You don't just get up and say, okay, let me brush myself off and let me just continue. You want to know. So why is it any different when it comes to our history and understanding your roots and where you're coming from? Let's not continue to suffer from this amnesia. Let's do the work and go on that journey. Sankofa. We've got the Sankofa bird I saw earlier. Um, I'd like to use it as a verb. Go and Sankofa. Do the work. Okay, go back and fetch what is yours. Go back and fetch, understand who you are so that you can be the best that you can be going forward. And we too can be the best. Thank you very much. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. We are stand up, you mighty people. Stand up, you mighty people. Thank you very much. I didn't give you much time to do that. When I asked you to do it, you, you didn't hesitate, Kembi, and you said yes. Yes to a calling from the ancestors. Because they know. They know how we've walked around in shame with heads bowed low. They know when our children come home and says, Mommy, is it true that we lived in trees in Africa? They know what it's like to be asked why their hair isn't good. We're still talking about good here and bad here. So I say, who have the bad here in here? I heard it in the car. I was coming with a group of people. Oh, you know the one with the good here? I said, stop the car and get me out here. Because me have, a, me have bad here, so me just get out of it. And these were teachers who ought to know better that we buy into this. Can be thank you. Put your hands together for our, our sister. Yes. Come on, drummers. Come on, drummers. Come on. Stand up, drummers. The drummers are going to play. Please stand up. Yes. Education gives you power. Do you understand that? Power to be human. We've been dehumanized for too long. We re-educate ourselves and we can walk with our shoulders high. A white friend of mine said to me many years ago, in a, in a patronizing way, superior way, I hope he's here. And he said to me, do, do you ever wish you were white? I was a young student at theological college and I said, not if it means I have to demean other people. Now sit down. So today, of that. Yes. the drum, the soul of the African hearts, reggae music, the drumming, please play the drums.
yes, yes, yes. The heartbeat of Africa. Please be reading. So with with Robert, um, with not Robert, not my with Reverend Simmons, please come forward. Put your hands together for Reverend Simmons, please. Yes. A reading from the book of Genesis. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel had it. I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hands against him. He and he will live in hostility towards all there between Kaddish and Berisht. So Agar bore Abram a son and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Agar bore him Ishmael. This is the word of the Lord. It's not the concept of the story, Ishmael and Hagar. The black woman who came through adversity. Hands up those of us who are still struggling a bit like Hagar to come through adversity. Come on. I mean, the rest of us have got it right. Those of us who have struggled to come through the difficult times in our lives, put your hands up, please. God is faithful, and Hagar experienced God's faithfulness. Well, I'm not the preacher because a wonderful preacher man is here. I didn't talk to you later on, okay? Professor Robert Beckford, put your hands up for him, please. <laughs> I try very hard when I take these services not to have people, and I include myself in that, on pedestal, up the top there, you know, the really important people. We're all important, okay? Are we agreed on that? We're all important. And I always get very nervous when I'm told that I'm more important than others, okay? I get really nervous about it. We've got to be really careful, okay? I love music because music is a heartbeat of black people. I love all kinds of music. I even love country music. We have lots of play of country music, you know. I know, I know. Sad, you know, sad black woman, but love country music, love soul, love reggae, love ska. Because I love, you can hear every piece of black music, the heartbeat of a drum. So we're going to hear some toots and the metals. And some, those who know toots and the metals, yeah, I can see the young ones going, hey. Is toots. Yeah, we're showing our age now, okay? Toots and come on then, sir. Join up, please. Start up, everybody. Come on. Come on. This is the birthday of those who have died. Life is tough.
Everything is getting higher and higher, higher and higher. Then your time to offer. Yeah, even the price of food going up higher and higher. Time to offer. Yeah. <laughs> Time to me. Everything is getting higher and higher, higher and high. Tell me time to. Yeah. Come on, to. Yeah. Still. And I said, how much should you pay for that? 25 pounds, Reverend E, for two ox steel. And we got five pounds for two ox steel. Time tough, indeed. Everything is getting home. Some poem. Where's our brother? Where is he? Where is our brother? Come on, sir. The poets. I saw him a minute ago. I know Sue is not here. I think her daughter is, her daughter-in-law is expecting a child um, any time now. So um, she, he's, she's not able to come. There's a young woman here who will mean a lot to me. Known her for years, took funeral for her family, and she's been in my life. So I'd like Noma to come forward, and indeed, Amit Jay to come forward as well. Put your hands together for them. I was invited, I was invited to go to a very, I get invited to a lot of places, but one of the places I will always remember for all the right reasons um, was Norma invited me to open an event down in the jewelry quarter where they were making African jewelry. You hear me say, I don't hear me say, we're not talking about going into TK Mark. So I miss buying the close eye, close eye, find the bargain. But jewelry, I've never known the history of jewelry, of African jewelry. So when I was invited to go and speak, I was so delighted. And so put your hands together for two people who have been teaching young people to learn the history of African jewelry. Put your hands together. Yeah. And I'm going to do something very personal because when I left here, I was to buy something for myself and I didn't know what to buy. And then when I went to speak at your opening your event, I had a brilliant idea that I'd buy a piece of jewelry. But well, the church, only the church was given to me a beautiful watch, which is che not cheap and I, I still wear it and for special occasion. And I, and I love jewelry, so I decided that I'd buy a brooch, is that right? And they made the brooch for me with the money from this church. And I'm going to have the seat for the first time. <laughs> oh, I've got the seat for the first time. Is it ready? Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Reverend Eve. It's a huge, huge privilege to be here. So I'll just tell you a little bit, um, a little bit about us and a little bit about our academy in the Jewelry Quarter uh, before we uh, do a presentation for Reverend Eve. So my name is Norma Banton. I've been making jewellery for 22 years. And um, after about seven years of making jewellery, I decided it was time to make jewellery change lives for other people. So I started a charitable foundation. Um, doing overseas missions. My first mission was to Haiti in 2011. Some of you might know there was a devastating earthquake there in 2010 where up to 360,000 people died. So I went to establish a jewellery workshop for people who could still 
use their hands. Then in 2012, I and 20 in 2012, I went to India twice to uh, work with women rescued from human trafficking. In 2014, I was very privileged to go to Nigeria which was my first trip to the motherland uh, to establish a jewellery workshop with widows. And then I was back in Nigeria doing another jewellery project in 2016. In 2019, I did a project in Grenada and then lives for young people in Birmingham. And we started a culturally relevant jewellery academy <laughs> called Masterpiece Academy. This is Omajok. He is my co-director, one of the co-directors of Masterpiece Academy. Uh, 2024 is our third year of trading. And to celebrate three years of Masterpiece Academy, we wanted to make jewellery change lives for even more people. In January, I kind of had a vision um, where I heard the ancestral cry and I decided it was time to answer the ancestral call and to follow in ancestral footsteps. So we decided we want to start jewellery academies in Africa, permanent academies in Africa, the Caribbean and the UK, completing the triangle of the African genocide. This is in honour of our ancestors. This is about celebrating them, bringing restorative justice along this route, which is soaked in the blood of our ancestors. It was really moving for me when in March, which is just last month, we went to Kenya to open, to establish our first permanent jewellery academy in Africa. And I'd like to tell you more about that, but we haven't got time today. So if you'd like to hear more about our project to Kenya, do come and see me afterwards. Um, there's so much to tell, and there's so many ways in which you can get involved. Together, we can make jewellery change lives. And so, and so now I would like to um, introduce Omajok Okwa. It was such a huge privilege to make this brooch, this commemorative uh, medal, which was first made to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the Windrush. Reverend Eve is, is just such a special person to me. She's so uh, dear to me from the, the first time I met her when she buried my mother in this church in 2015 we've had a very special relationship. So it was a, it's always a huge honour when she's able to come and support us at our events. And it's a real honour to present this um, brooch, which commemorates the 75th anniversary of the Windrush. And Omajok is going to tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, because, um, yeah, greetings, everybody. Yeah, we had a, um, a brief from the... The charity, lottery. the lottery charity, and they wanted us to commemorate the Windrush. But when I was visioning the idea of the Windrush, I couldn't just put it on the Windrush itself. I had to commemorate our people's history as a whole. So you have to start in Africa. Jinyame, that's the symbol. We, they took us across to the Caribbeans and the Americas. Sankofa. Sankofa is to remember. Remember where you're coming from. And then now we've completed the triangle and we've ended up in the UK. That's where all the wealth that they fought us, forced us to work for them went. So part of it is I've got different symbols in it. Adaptability in Chin Chin. No matter what, where we go, we will make our way. So, like Norma said, we had the vision because we're supposed to be giving back to our people. Some of us have got skills. We're not going to stay here forever. We have to, have to pass it on to others. And that would be you would become an ancestor. You would become commemorated for your work that you is going to put down. So, is I was explaining that to Reverend Eve, and she really felt that. And she wanted... <clears throat> it has to be that. Um, because 
you know how deeply I feel about the journey of our ancestors. It's in my veins. And so when I, I was overwhelmed, I say, that's the one. And I will use the thousand pounds. I'll use some of it to buy it and put it on my lapel when I go out. Where's the church warden? Please. And because I'm so shy, it's got to be small. And, the, and with, these, with this medal as well, there's only 12 of them going to be made. This is the second one to be sold. So if anybody's interested in having this as a commemorative medal to remember. So could you tell you us come. what's on it, please? <laughs> well, I've got a picture here. Yeah, we can't really. Yeah, it's yeah, like a, us, yeah. there's a triangle at the center of it. That's our journey. Right in the center of it, that's the Windrush ship. Like I said, when we began, we began in Africa, and that was Jinyame. When we went across to the Caribbean, that became Sankofa. Right at the top is Inchinchin, which means adaptability. But around the medal, when you look at it, there's sugarcane in one side of it. And then there's hands in the sea, because the background is like the sea. And they're in the, the ones they threw us overboard, that's the ones who did not make it. That is part of our journey. I remember them tonight. And on the other end of it, there's a machete. That was the tool used to generate the wealth for Britain. The Industrial Revolution. And right on the top of that, there's the British crown. That's where our labors, our death, our suffering went to nourish this country. And right at the bottom, there's a Cory shell. The symbol of wealth, fertility, and also you can use it to vision your own future as well. So it's got a combination of different things within this medal. And like I said, there's only going to be 10 left, so if you're interested. Well, <laughs> so, um, when I, this dress I have on, um, come and sit down, please. This dress I'm wearing, my very first ancestor service, a beautiful woman came in and she said, this is for, I was told to make this specially for you, the Queen of Egypt. I was very humbled. I hope she made this beautiful dress for me and I wear it to all the ancestor service and it's fitting that this is going to be on this dress. Yep. And I've also got I've got the I've got the image of it with the explanations going down the side. So if anybody wants to read this. I can give them a look. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I put it on the screen later. Just a minute. Let me just. Yes. So all the symbols of our journey. And when I saw it out in tears, it meant so much to me. And I'm sure it was to you. I couldn't afford it without the money the Holy Trinity has given to me, I have to say. I'm going to have to insure it. We must be proud of the legacy of our people. So each really one, important. each medal that is sold is going towards the school. It's going to be funding us in the UK, in the Caribbean, and in Africa. 
So uh, the medal is available at just £750. It's solid silver, handcrafted with full Birmingham hallmarks. And as Omajot said, the proceeds are going to Masterpiece Academy. We work with young people, mostly aged 19 to 25. Um, and as I say, we are not just a jewellery academy, but we're a culturally relevant jewellery academy. And I loved when Kembi mentioned the jewellery made in um, Kemet because um, the oldest jewellery found in the world was found in ancient Egypt, made by the Kemetic people, which is the black Egyptians, the original Egyptians. So this DNA, you know, we didn't just rock up and decide, oh, we're going to be jewellers. It's in our DNA. The gold comes from Africa. The gemstones come from Africa. So it's right that we should be passing this legacy on to the young people um, in, in fact, the triangle yeah. of our um, ancestry. Thanks to Holy Trinity again. And our oh, legacy. <laughs> Put your hands together for mm, our sister and our brother. Of those who have learned something about the, the jewelry making traditions of Africa, and of those who've learned something, that's what I wanted to do today for us to learn new things about our culture because we've been told so much nonsense and we believe it. I, I stopped little black girls in the street and little black boys and I asked them this, and they say, No, do you like your hair? No. And I did this on Saturday, little black girl, two little African girls and their baby sister in Nottingham. I do it in Birmingham all the time. I said, did you know? Put, put it on the floor. I said, tell me what you like about yourself. So tell me what you like about yourself. And she said nothing. Yeah. And I said, why not? I don't like my hair. Don't sound surprised. Because that's the eternal, eternal internalization of self hate that we, many of us, have stood by and let our children learn. If we are going to move on, told me that before. So look, tell them that they're beautiful. Okay, thank you. One of our great baritones, Mr. Byron Jackson. Please put your hands together for him. Okay, put your hands together for Mr. Jackson. Yeah. We didn't hear that, man. Come on, come on, come on. Yes, yes, woo, 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 woo. yes, yeah, yeah. I know I'm an Anglican. Yes, I'm still an Anglican. They haven't exactly kicked me. This called Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes child alone ways from home. Oh, a long ways from home. I believe 
form. Yes, 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 yes. A long, a long way from home. A long, long way from home. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home. Indeed, I know that feeling. Yes, beautiful. Okay. Okay. Now, Joshua did fight that Battle of Jericho. We're still fighting that battle. We haven't won yet, but we are going to get there if we all work together. Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. Oh, well, yes, you can join in. Can you cut the, uh, the sound? Thank you. Chasha fit the battle of Jericho, 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 Lord. Chasha fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Chasha fit the battle of Jericho, 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 Lord. Chasha fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Up to the walls of Jericho. He marched with spear in hand. Go blow them ram horns, Joshua cried, because the battle is in my hand. Joshua be the battle of Jericho, 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 Lord. Joshua be the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. You may talk about the man of Gideon, Talk about the man of Saul, but there's none like the good old Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. Yeah, Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho, Jericho, 
Jericho, just your fear the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Then the ram home sheep began to blow, trumpets began to sound. Joshua commanded the children to shout, and the walls came tumbling down that morning. Joshua fear the battle of Jericho, 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 Lord. Joshua fear the battle of Jericho. And the walls came tumbling down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you very thank much. You. Now those were the singing words. It'll come back later. Yes. With a couple more. Yeah, a, a poetry. I love Michael. Where is Michael? Please put your hands together for Michael, who is going to do some poem for us. Come on, sir. Put your hands together for him, okay? The spoken word, powerful, and the power of the spoken words. That's a lot of keep me in the country, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's not really that. Joshua brought the battle of Greetings, blessings in the name of everything that is good and pleasant on the land. I've just finished lyrics, writing this lyrics this morning, and it um, goes like this. Can I hear you, sir? Can you hear me? Mike. All right, hold on, hold on. Let me just do this thing properly. I will just refer to what is called dancing. Dancing, my brothers and sisters, is not just meant for showing off is appreciation for being. It's a thankfulness to one's self. It's like growing through what you're going through. It's the ability to conduct an inner dialogue with oneself. Dancing is an internal communication involving both mental and physical for the benefit of the individual. So forget your sorrows and dance. Forget your weaknesses and dance. Forget your sicknesses and dance. Neglect dance at your peril, brothers and sisters. The main body of lyrics is called the sounds of our drums. <laughs> sounds of our drums. I love drums. Loved it from I was a little boy of five years of age. And I wrote this one. It's not just for me and myself and I. It's about, it's about, it's for us, for we. Our ancestors bequeathed us many traditions. One such treasure is the holy drum. Disrespect drum. And you're going to repent. It is the oldest musical instrument mankind invent. Honorable, honorable drum. Your humble decorum, a sacred goat skin, a visionary tree. Grace us with your melodies, blissful ecstasies, your joyous energies, a bold, strident, radiant beat, rhythms so sweet, barriers retreat. Break dance, backflips, somersaults, greet. Shuffling, moonwalking, splits to complete. When bass drum dance, her smiling eyes, teardrops drenched. Her stunning shadows, ecstatic. Bounces way, way beyond, serenade. 
songs or drums made expand beyond dimensions. Oh, blessed, blessed universe. Thongs of our drums echoes a serene hum, radiating waves, resonating waves, pulsating magnetic vibrations, blending time and space, a passionate embrace. Drum inside my chest are the best. Blessed to manifest peace, love, blissful happiness. Yes, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. Everyone is a vibrant song, a talented musician in transition, transmitting melodious musical compositions. Don't take my word for it. If in doubt, check it out. But drum, if you're not sweet like a sugar plum, sensational inspirational wisdoms, everybody wants some. Deaf, blind, classified, dumb, whole wide world, everybody welcome. Sick, nourished, hungry, fed. Empress Naya Binge dancing inside their heads. Decorating their thoughts, nourishing their hearts. While birds in the sky float and hover, fishes in the sea swimming undercover. Deep, dark depths, desolate outer space where everyone needs a boat. Music simply lay back and float. Mystics insist, never underrate. Medical professions only recently appreciate. Life, a gift, a honor, and a celebration of creation. Felt in my heart, kidneys, liver, and lungs, like delicious chocolates dissolving on my tongue. Sweetest roses in spring mingling within my cranium when I hear the voice of reverential drum. Sensations buzz between my toes. Perspirations dance on the bridge of my nose. I become a vibrant instrumentation. Sparkling constellations, glistening, glowing golden suns, brilliant spectrum. When bass drum rumble in a concrete jungle, wicked after humble. When bass drum rumble in a concrete jungle, all walls crumble. In my heart, when bass drum boom and bass drum roar, I feel it in my heart, my core. People are rock on every seashore. Bass drum stand up in a folklore. Like Sam's in a tear up a bolted door. Like earthquake a rip up a concrete floor. Wasps love to sting. Birds, spirit, and wings. Lovers love to cling. Yes, empresses and kings. Drum after it in. <laughs> The drum. There we go. Sorry, someone's blocking someone in the vicarage. A white Honda YM67 LDZ. Could you please move your car? YM67 LDZ, White Honda. If that belongs to someone, could they please move it because they're blocking someone from coming out of the vicarage? Okay, no? Okay. One of the things I enjoy, when you have positions, when you have a position uh, as the one I've had for many years as a priest, you must use it for good and, and pick up young people and give them chance to shine. Kwame, I met him quite a few years ago at a funeral. Come on, sir. And he's going to play for us. It's just saxophone. And very brilliant guy. Put him together. Okay. Yes, yes.
Good afternoon. I'm going to play about, I'm going to play three songs for you. The first song I'm going to play is um, I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. So it's a, a spiritual song just for what helped us through the trials and tribulations with Christianity. The second song is Summertime. And the last song I'm going to play is from the Harry of Tobin movie, and it's called Stand Up. So it's, it's like a um, an empowering song to help us through freedom. Can we hear you? You can hear me? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to play three songs for you. The first song is I Want Jesus to Walk With Me. So that's a song that helped us through the trials and tribulations, through slavery and just empower us. And then summertime. And then the last and final song I'm going to play for you is a song from the movie Harriet Tubman. It's like an empowerment song what helped us get through that childless times. um <laughs> Thank you. 
It's our job to go and tell. I love men. Yes, you hear me. Yeah. Okay. I can. I can. I can hear people saying, "Lord Jesus, you're a Christian. That she loves men. When my father is a man, may I have to love black men and respect them." There's one man in this place today. I love his intellect. I love his common touch. His ability to speak to anyone on the most difficult of subjects of theology and history and help us to make sense of it. I think of many men who could do it. But one of my favorite, and I said one, because we can hear somebody saying, well, I thought she said this last year before we bought another man. You know, so, yeah, yeah. Professor Robert Beckford, please put your hands together to welcome our speaker. Yes! Thank you. Greetings. I wasn't sure tonight if you want uh, an Anglican sermon or talk, just seven minutes, or a Pentecostal one for two hours and seven minutes. As it's an Anglican church, I'll go with the Anglican Pentecostal somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes and merge the two traditions. But before I get started, it's important to remember that in African traditional religion, before you become an ancestor, you are an elder. And elders are the people who have lived a bit of life. They have contributed to the community and people acknowledge them for the work that they have done. And most of us are here today because of the work that was done by some of the elders. And I can tell you that I am standing here today because of some of the elders who are in this room. And one of them, a couple of them I want to acknowledge before I get started. You see, I'm playing with the seven and a half minutes now. I'm adding a bit at the beginning. One of the elders I want to acknowledge Sorry, the language went all funny then, didn't I? I'd like to acknowledge is Asata Owen. Because a lot of people won't know this, but when I first came to Birmingham back in 1990, I'd finished my master's degree in London and I didn't have a job. And I was working in temp work despite having two degrees at that point. And I called Bourneville College because I heard that they had a course there where they had some black lecturers who were open to helping black people. Rare, you see. And I called them. Asata picked up the phone. And by the time we'd finished, she'd given me some work to do at the college. And that started me off. That started me off in terms of my teaching career. But what I learnt from Asata wasn't just giving people opportunity, it was also about consistently investing in your community and people. And that's what she taught me. And I'll tell you, just before I get started, because I'm just adding the time on now, work with me, throughout the whole of my academic career, I have held that up as a standard for my own achievement. I do not achieve unless I open up opportunities for other black people and I make sure that I am accessible. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of this. When I started teaching later on at the Queen's College um, over in Birmingham, 
I made sure that we had a free course for any black person who wanted to do theology. You could literally walk in off the street, even if you weren't qualified, because that's what they used to do in the access course. Give everybody an opportunity. One of the people who walked in and took advantage was a young man from Birmingham. He'd studied at Birmingham University, done no work in theology, studied with us for a little while because it was a free course. That guy today is Professor Anthony Reddy, the first black person to get a chair in theology at Oxford University in 900 years. That came from the access course, the stuff I learned on the access course. When I started working at the BBC, because you know, we have to have a side hustle as black people, two, three, going on, because you don't know when they're going to come from you. You have to have a little something on the side. When I started working for the BBC, this young producer came to see me, and he said, you are further along than me. Can you please give me an opportunity to work with you? So I said, that's fine. I developed two ideas. He took them to BBC Bristol. BBC Bristol said, we're going to make these two ideas because we think that they're brilliant. We made the two programs. We won an award for each one, a race in the media award for each one. This guy then said, I am going to start making films because you have given me a platform. It was, nine, it was 2003. That guy today is David Olashoga. His starting point was because what I learned from New Way Access, you make sure that you open up those opportunities. When I was teaching down in Kent, we took this further. We moved the department to London, people who were in London who wanted to study theology. Out of the hundred or so students that we led to degrees in theology, just on this special project, two of them at this moment are doing PhDs with me now in my current work over in Winchester. Wow. Because of what I learned from the elders. So what I want to say before I get started is, people like me who get to these positions, it doesn't happen by chance. It's because of the work and sacrifice that other people have made. So I just want to big up Asata while I'm here, because I've never had the opportunity to say thank you for the work that you did. All right, now I can get started now. So let us pray in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and in the memory of the spirit of the ancestors, we pray that you, every word that is spoken, every theme that is thought will be consistent with your way. Jesus, our Savior, Redeemer, Liberator, Friend, Lover, Amen. It, but which one you choose will have a profound impact on how you remember. So how we remember the ancestors is just as important as what we remember about the ancestors. And what I want to talk about in the next seven, eight, ten minutes is bad memory regarding the ancestors, how we should remember rightly. Let's start off with bad memory, because there are problematic ways in which we can remember the past. And if you went to school in Britain, this is nearly normative because much of the way in which we are expected to remember our African past is problematic. And there are two ways in which people, people remember in the wrong way. The first one is plain and simply to tell lies about the past. Bad memory is about telling lies about the past. And look, if like me you went to school in Britain, much of what we were taught about the app was lies. British history was built on Western philosophy, which argued that there was nothing good with... He says Africans have no intelligence, no history. Even Hume, the English philosopher, who wrote about civility, democracy. Remember Africa is to see it as a void. It's one of the reasons why if you look at some of the old maps of the thing important happened there. The way in which you can remember wrongly is simply by telling lies about the past. Another way in which people remember the past and the ancestors, and people did absolutely nothing liberate themselves. You don't learn about the history 
of the rebellions across the West Indies. Taka's Rebellion, 1760, one of the most important rebellions, one of the most important rebellions that takes place, that shakes the Atlantic world because Taki and the other, Jamaica, the other enslaved in Jamaica wanted their freedom. Taki's Rebellion was in the memory of the 18th and 19th century rebellions that take place across the regions. If you're from Barbados, you see by an Oxford ethicist, not historian, ethicist called Nigel Bigger. Book is called Colonialism, A Moral Reckoning. Best-selling book out there amongst Anglicans at this point in time. Selena Stone's trying to catch them up with her Lent book, but it hasn't caught them up just yet. In this book, when he looks at slavery, he calls Caribbean slavery humane. Half truth, you say. There might have been some humane stuff, but a building a better life for yourself. That's why it's important. Not that just we remember these folks. Remembering wrongly is about telling lies. Remember rightly is all about getting to the truth of the matter. It's looking at history in its complexity. It's remembering what took place in the past at every dimension, at every perspective that you can get hold of so that you build the biggest picture. It's the most beautiful part of the world, cosmos. I'm just joking, not, part, not the cosmos, but you know how they like to big it up out there in terms of Portland. My grandmother's name was Maud, and Maud came from one of the maroon communities in Portland. And we used to think that was fantastic. Said, my goodness, we come from these rebellious people, Jamaican royal family. About the history and tell it its entirety, we realized that they weren't always that civil. We realized that while they won their own freedom, they were also equally happy to hunt down other enslaved Africans and send them back to their masters on the plantations. So we learned through that more complicated history that the Maroon heritage in with the complexity of the history. And that means that when we look at African history, when we look at the history of the diaspora, We've got to think about all the multiple perspectives and angles that there are on it in order to get the biggest and most complex picture possible because that's right memory. Understanding to the best of your ability what actually took place. But right memory isn't just about that complexity, it's also about what we call, we call insurrecting the subjugated history is a past way of saying, telling the stories that other people haven't told. You see, because right memory isn't just about the complexity, it's about finding the stories that need to be told that other people haven't told. Think, for example, of the way in which the history of black women in the Caribbean and in Britain is yet to be told in its entirety. Write memories about telling those hidden stories because when you look at slave history, the history of the enslaved, and you go through the list of punishments that enslaved Africans had to endure every day on the plantations, out of every 10 punishments, seven of them were for women. Where were the men? Them gone, frightened. They call it the petticoat revolution. The fact that it was the black women who were the ones who were doing everything to slow down the mechanisms of slavery. Stella Dadzi writes about this in her book, A Kick in the Belly. She has a couple of articles on this as well in the journal Race and Class, where she just looks at how at every level of operation, from person you need to say it to a tekal dear. <laughs> Why did they do that? Because you slow down the mechanism of slavery. Master saying, where's the something? Well, if you go by so-and-so, and you turn by there, and then when by the time you come down, if everybody's doing that, nobody's going to get anything done that day. <laughs> Circumlocution. You see, so what I'm saying is part of right memory is insurrecting these hidden stories. Same thing is true when we look at the history of black Britain. We forget about the work that the women have done. Looking after the children is one of them. 
It's unpaid labor. We often forget about that's important labor. We often neglect the fact that at every moment of crisis, in the last 75 years, that 1957, I was there, I wasn't there, I wasn't born yet, 1957, when they murdered Kelso Cochran, first West Indian Gazette, the first newspaper, it was the women who were there. If we're talking about the history of Christianity, black Christianity in Britain, you can't tell this story without focusing on what the women did. Black church movement in Britain was set up, established, funded by the black women. Yet when you read the textbooks, it's always Pastor John so-and-so, Pastor Samuel so-and-so, Pastor Michael so-and-so. We've forgotten the work that the women actually did to establish these churches in the first year. Right memory is about telling these other stories. In critical race theory, they call it counter-narratives. The fact that you've got to tell these other stories to challenge the way in which people think the world went. So why is right memory important? Well, if wrong memory is about oppression, right memory is about liberating you. You see, because when you realize the complexity of the history, it provides you with new ways of thinking about who you are. When you are dealing with right history and you are insurrecting these subjugated narratives, telling these other stories, it's empowering. It liberates you. See, right memory is about liberation, but the liberation isn't just for you. The liberation is for everybody else. You see, to live with right, right memory is redemptive. Yeah. It saves you and it saves those you come into contact with. Right memory is vitally important for remembering the ancestors. That's why I'm going to end with this. Don't worry, I'm coming down nicely to stay in the Pentecostal church. That's why it's crucially important to remember rightly the, what the African theologians call ancestor Jesus. Because they say people have forgotten to remember rightly that ancestor Jesus was a person of color. People of the, what they call here the, the, the Near East, because it's, it's Eurocentric, it's Near East of Europe. They didn't call it that there. The Afro-Asiatic region. Everybody had a bit of color. The African theologians say you've got to remember rightly that Jesus looked like you, may have even sounded like you. We know even now that he lived around people who were enslaved like your ancestors. We even know that some of the biblical texts were written by enslaved, New Testament texts, enslaved people. They say you've got to remember rightly the ethnicity of ancestor Jesus. Not only that, they say you've got to remember rightly the politics of ancestor Jesus because you've been told the wrong things about what Jesus was about because when Jesus says give the people bread he's going up against a political system that used starvation to oppress the people and we're seeing that played out to an effect in Palestine at this particular point in time starvation used to oppress the people Jesus is going up against the system when Jesus says forgive their debts He's challenging the economic order because everybody was in debt to either the temple authorities or the Roman authorities. So it's calling for a different economic system altogether. The Africans tell us, you've got to remember rightly ancestor Jesus. So what does this all mean for us today then? What does it mean for us then? to remember rightly in this place. But I think there are three really things that we have, the important things that we have to take away. We can't remember rightly if we don't put the knowledge in our heads ourselves. We've got to do the work. We've got to read the books. We've got to turn the right pages. We can't be ignorant about our own history because you're not going to get taught it in schools. You're not going to get taught it in colleges unless you come and teach with me. I'll obviously study with me because obviously I do other work. You're not going to get it on television, not even on Netflix. So remembering rightly begins with you putting that knowledge in your head. Remembering rightly though also has ethical implications. It means that you've got to have 
moral courage. Because remembering rightly, if it's about redemption, if it's about liberation, then you've got to be willing to share the knowledge that you have. And sharing this knowledge in a context like contemporary Britain is always going to get you in trouble. People don't like, like to know the truth. And some people have closed their ears to the truth. So like Hindi Andrews called his book Psychosis of Whiteness because he spent years talking to white people who didn't want to know the truth. If you are going to share this stuff, then you need to have some moral courage. You've got to be willing to do what it takes, say what it takes, no matter what the cost. Absolutely. So we've got to have the knowledge. We've got to have the, the moral courage to go along with it as well. And, and, and we can't remember rightly and not be willing to organize for change. Because surely the memory and the spirit of the ancestors, when we remember them in their entirety, when we remember them and, and the narratives that have been subjugated, when we remember them as a way of doing liberation, then it's a cure for the individualism and the ways in which we have been told not to work with each other in order to keep us in wrong memory. You see, right memory is about mobilizing the people for change because one thing that the ancestors taught us which we know is true is that we are stronger together that that we need each other that you teach me i teach you we know that as i started with when the elders empower the people the people then can go and organize for change Remember rightly. Remember rightly. Thank you. It would be easy just to move on, but I like silence. Silence for us to reflect on what we've just heard. We've heard a lot of stuff tonight, boy. That's why I put these services together, because I'm learning too. So if you think it's just for you, it's for me too, so I can learn from the great minds and talent within our community. That was powerful. Yes. So let's be silent. Now let us sit down and listen to a piece of Barry's Hammond. Please be seated, everybody. They all go together. Shine.
up, everybody. Stand up, rise and shine. He said, rise and shine. That's the theme of tonight. Not just to look back, but to look forward. The sermon made it very clear. Rise and shine. Rise and shine, people. This is our moment of remembrance. Rise and shine, says Barry Hammond. Against the background of everything, but especially the sermon, that's a permission for us to be well informed, to put rather crassly, to get rid of individualism. Have I got that right, Professor? Yeah. Not to pull the ladder up once we get where we think we want to be but to actually put the ladder down so everybody else can come up. Please be seated, everybody. We're going to remember now. We want you to call out the names of as many as the, of the ancestors. According to African spirituality and my limited understanding of it, is that you don't become an ancestor until a year, but you started the journey. If you look at the flyer, you'll see lots of faces on the flyer. And I put them there when I was first drawing up the service because I wanted us to remember those who are still here and who are important and those who sadly departed. So if you have loved ones, Marcus Garvey, anybody, the Messiah, Marcus Messiah Garvey, and for all of those names, I've got the water here and the plant. I can't pretend to know everything that there is to know about the way the Africans bury their dead or remember their dead. But I know enough to know we can do it with dignity. Are we agreed on that? So you call out the names, please, and, I will, and I'm, I've been told by those who are in the know that we say a share. Is that right? A share, share, okay? Right, start now, please, nice and loud. Please stand and say your name individually. Okay, call the names, please. We'll pause a while for Benjamin Zephaniah. His family, they're here. Them dire. I can't imagine many of us who weren't shocked when we heard that Benjamin had died. I think many of us are still reading from that. Will you please put this picture up for me, Mr. Rutherford? I've asked Mr. Rutherford to put the picture up and so we remember him, let's pause for Benjamin Zephaniah. 
the talented poets. I was listening to him yesterday morning on Radio 4. They're playing some stuff, some of his poetry. So please tune in and catch up with some of his early works, okay? So Benjamin reminds us of a raw, complicated and sophisticated talent with words. Our beloved brother, let us remember him in silence with the drums. We are his family, okay? Remember them, hold them in our prayers, and the ancestors will comfort them, and the creator will walk with them. Bye-bye, our beloved brother. He went so suddenly. Let's call out some more names now. Nice and loud, please. to touch. Rico.
So let's remain silent for the countless numbers. For those whose names we've not known, for those who were forgotten under the sea, please be seated. For those who were beaten so badly with undignified burials because of their blackness. For those for whom no one cared. And yet, the joy the joy of being able to remember them. Thank you. Thank you. What a people we are. What a nation we are, being told that we are nobodies. I shall fight that with every ounce of energy I have, with my children and my grandchildren, so they can walk with their heads held high. I don't have a monopoly on knowledge, nor does Professor Robert. Each of us must find the knowledge We're going to listen to Sam Cooke. A change is going to come.
got to work together, put simply, to bring that necessary change, feel good moments. There has to be a change. We're in pain. We're going to have to work with our white brothers and sisters if they're willing to work. Because this is going to be for their benefit too. You know what I'm saying? If them things says only we have to do the work, my white brothers and sisters are going to have to put the work in. And we can't do it for them. It's not our job. For the next generation of young people. For those of us who are getting older, don't write me off yet. Don't write Eve Pitts off. Don't write ourselves off. Because each of us have a contribution to make. Are we agreed on that? Yes. yes. We're going to hear that we're nearly there. Mr. Jackson is going to come and sing for us again as we have some time to set ourselves right, to have something to eat, some hand food. Can you all hear me? You yes. should, should be able to hear me by now. Yes. Right? <laughs> so for those who don't know, I'm a professional opera singer. Yes. Professionalizing up. Yes. No, I didn't do it. No, I didn't do it. <laughs> and I was born, raised, and trained here in Birmingham. This is my city. This is where my deep come from, yeah? And I'm also the artistic director of a new opera company, which he, who has invested in me, she sees me as value. And, you know, we have, I have love, absolute love and mutual respect for this woman, because she has, even through the hard times, has given me that moral support. And she's also the patron of the Solar Arts. I have single-handedly over a hundred thousand pounds. Because of the colour of his 
skin, it was to give a legitimate repertoire that he justly deserved. That needs to change. We as a community need to change that. Because otherwise, we won't have any more well, offerings dying. And I think we as a black community can keep the opera art from life. We need to have more opera and classical music musicians coming from our communities. Yeah? Yeah. We need to support that. called Deep River, a well-known spiritual. We will cross over Jordan, yeah? We will get to the other side and emerge victorious. Deep River.
finish now. Next one. And we all know that one, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Order. Come on. got the whole world beautiful rendition sometimes it's a good reminder we know somewhere in our head that he has she has the world in his hands and her hands but sometimes a simple simple song with power and sincerity is a good reminder he's got our brother who's gone all too quickly in his hands he's got everybody here in I'm hands. Is that right? Let's say it. He got everybody here in his hands. So, wait a minute, please, please. Before we say, I say thank you, let's have a moment of silence. And we start the Lord's Prayer. For those who know it, please say it. And for those who don't want to say it, I respect that. So let's say together, our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for being yourselves. I want to thank all those who have contributed to this evening. I want to thank our jazz, young jazz musician. Where is it? Please stand where you are, sir. I'd like to thank the poets. Where is he, Michael? Is Michael here? 
I want to thank Michael for a beautiful poem. Put your hands together for him, please. I want to thank our, our pianist, sir. Please stand. What's your name? <laughs> Howard. Howard. Put your hands together for him. Thank you. Thank you. I really want to thank my good friend. <laughs> when the phone rings and Mrs. say him, I don't answer till me have the time. Because <laughs> we cover just about everything. We talk about everything. I want to thank Noma and all your colleagues. Your beautiful friendship has meant a lot. Your friendship has meant a lot to me over the years. We have much to talk about because we're women of passion. Black women are passionate women, you know. So I want all the women in the house to stand, please. Please be seated. All the women in the house to stand. All, all the women in the house to stand up, please. Thank you. No, stay where you are, Kembe, please. Thank to Kembe for outlining the history of our people, the beginning. And if you don't believe me, let's try to get rid of women and see what happens. <laughs> let's tell women to them no, 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 no use and see what happens. So we put our hands together for women. Please be seated, women. Please be seated. We want our men to stand up now, please. Men, our gallant men, our wonderful men, big them up. Stand up. We can't do without them. We can't work without them. Without them, until we work together, our wonderful black men, we give thanks for them. We forget them at our peril. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We want to say thanks singularly for Professor Robert Beckford. Yay. Please stand, sir, by himself. For the great poets in our midst, for the opera singers in the making, I wanted to be an opera singer. Oh, yeah. You know, I wanted to be an opera singer. I went for the audition and got for the rep at Manchester University, the Guildhall School of Music, and got in. My mother said, You can't leave me on the wall, me are the only picnic we have. Bless her. But I know I would have made a great opera singer because that's my voice. That's the voice that God gave me until I had an overactive thyroid during the lockdown and I lost there. But I've gone back to my piano lessons because I grew up with a piano and opera singing in my home. So I've gone back to learning my piano again. Yeah. So we must acknowledge and underline each other's gifts. You know, we have some serious waking up to do. We want to buy a place of our own where we can have meetings and we can use it for when we're having events. We are the one group of people who only have one or two places in Birmingham that we can call our own. It's something and a group that I am totally committed to. I've not been at my best since I retired, I've been a sick. But I had to work through some issues in my head about who am I? Who am I, this black woman who is passionate about things? I've had to take a stand back, step back, because I needed to sort out my emotions to grieve the job I've loved. I've loved being a priest. I'm still a priest, of course, 
but I'm not a vicar anymore, and I had to really work that one through, because I'm used to being a leader. I'm a leader by nature, and I've had to really work hard at sorting out my head. I have cried, and that's okay, because if you get so strong that you can't cry, you're in trouble. <laughs> so I was able to cry and to really grieve a change in my life. Pray for me. I'm writing my book. I've been asked to write it. Yeah. So, and um, I've got, you know, um, I've, I've got a publisher. He heard me on Radio 4 and said, I'll publish your book. Just write it. So, um, and pray for me that I'll be able to do that. And we pull one another up. Because when we do that, we are going somewhere when we do that. So thank you, Professor. Thank you for the family who continues to grieve for a brother. Your sister has also died in recent days. We hold you in the prayers of God's people, okay? All right? So today as we say goodbye and thank you, we're going to stand and listen to our own heartbeat. Please stand. And then we're going to listen to a wonderful song one of my favorite, Behold. Is that right? Yes. By culture. And so those who know culture. Oh yeah, of course. Good afternoon. Um, Benjamin Zephaniah's sister, Millicent. A lot of people know me as Millie. I just wanted to say we had a really lovely afternoon in Hansworth Park um, on doing the mural, what they'd done for Benjamin in the park. It was really beautiful. And I also just wanted to let you know that it would have been Benjamin's 66th birthday tomorrow. So that was a lovely tribute. And my sister, sadly, Benjamin's twin, passed away last Tuesday. So we, we're going through a lot right now, and people who know me know it's kind of hard to be getting through all this, but thank you, everybody, for your prayers, for your love. Big up my brother. Big him up. Thank you. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, behold, I come quickly. Sing along. I know and I know that this was the voice the voice of the most high and I know yes I know it was the voice or oh, the voice of the most yes I'm saying say, behold Smiling. 
many and was longer and I know that this was and I know yes I know it was the voice or oh, the voice of the most high say behold behold Okay, please be seated for one minute, please. Thank you. We all that come quickly. Please be seated. Silence, please. Absolute silence. We nearly finished now. And I like order. Wait a moment, not for now. Just, I said earlier that we're one of the few people who do not have a place or places we can call our own. I'm a member of a group called Opal, our people, our legacy. I mean, I like talking about things that we can't achieve, especially a black woman. This is not the first church I've done up so it could stay open. I did it to Emmanuel. I saved it from closure. So I like to do things and make them happen. And I sometimes get really despairing when the good idea of Opal, which is and that people won't turn off the light and tell us to go when we're not finish. Because we don't have no respect for us. So we, he started this group and we've worked with him. Please tell us about this vision, Mr. Ivy. Thank you, Rev. Good evening, all. Don't worry, I haven't got to be too serious. The thing about us as a people is that we talk a lot, which is good. We talk about change, but unfortunately, we don't apply the action to bring that change. And that's a big difference. <laughs> Opal is trying its endeavor best to do that. We are trying to be change agents, but we need the support of our people. Our people who talk about it daily. We need this, we need that, etc. In order for us to get that, we've got to work as a community. This is one thing that you guys don't like to hear. It costs money. My man here has just told you, on his own, he's raised 100,000 pounds. Congratulations, sir. Very well, very well done. We have achieved goals like that, but it's nowhere near enough. We have invested in the Legacy Centre. Do you all know that? Formerly the drum, right? We have invested heavily as Opal in that. So we are a part of that. So if you ask us what have we done over the past five years, I can say under the leadership of Reverend Eve, because she was a chair at the time, we helped to acquire Legacy Center. And let me tell you, Legacy Center is owned by black people. It's not rented. It's not supported by the government or anything. <laughs> and the thing about that center that you might not know, it's the largest art, sorry, it's the largest black owned art center in Europe. We own that here in Aston. <laughs> So why do we have meetings? Why do we ask people to come and listen to us? We want you to know what we are trying to achieve and how you can help us to achieve that. If this was a meeting, I would be saying here, or Kemby or Joyce or whoever is saying that we need people to invest, not a lot. I know that 500 pounds seems a lot of cash, and it is. But if we was to invest 500 pounds per person over a period of time, 
there's so much that we can do. If we look at our elders, do we look after them? No, we leave it to the system to do that. Look at our young kids at school. We leave it for the system to educate them. Everything we leave to. A, a guy told me once, we've got access to everything, and he's right. We've got access. But that access means they can close the door whenever they want. They can let us in whenever they want. We need that key ourselves. We need to have the access whenever we can. We need to have our own. And together, we can achieve that. Thank you. What do you want us to do, sir? If you're interested, I shouldn't say if, because you should be interested, how you can invest, what period of time you need to, or when our next meeting is, we can tell you that. Okay? Thank you, Rev. Finally, and I have to say, Opal, it must be said, it's the best team I've ever worked with. We, work, we respect each other. It doesn't mean we don't disagree. But we disagree respectfully. Is that right? When we have differences of opinion, we listen to each other carefully. And we don't pull each other down behind their back. Did they hear me? Yes. When me not there, me know nobody's talking about me in a negative way. Because it's not the nature of that group. We don't do that. There's mutual respect. Is that right? When that happens, we are power, power, powerful. When black people work together, it's powerful. So we better get our act together and plug into a powerful group, Opal. Please think about it. I leave the drumming to the last our people, our legacy. I love drumming, the heartbeat of Africa. Yes, you heard me, the heartbeat of Africa. So as we stand, for me to say the final blessing, the drummers are going to take over and they're going to let us hear the heartbeat of Africa. Put your hands together for our wonderful drummers, please. Please stand up, everybody. Stand up, hands up, stand up, and um, and uh, the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in the knowledge and the love of God and His Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love, now and always. Amen, everybody. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Put your hands together for yourselves. Big up yourselves. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. There are people who've come a long way. We've journeyed and we've succeeded. We've failed. We've cried and we've laughed. Let's hear some the heartbeat of Africa. The African drums, please.
Right, thank you very much. Please remain standing. Don't move at all. I'm going to switch the light out and you'll see why in a moment. Please, thank you. Thank you. I want you to listen very carefully. Very, very carefully. Mr. Rutherford.
we can go quietly with dignity. In our heads and our hearts, lest we forget. So please, let's behave with dignity as we go for a glass of something. For all the drink that they didn't have. For all the noise that they didn't make. Let's scream on the top of our voices. Yes! Yes! For all the sounds that they didn't make. Yes! Come on! Come on! For all the times when they couldn't scream when they wanted to. Do it again! Yes! A young group of young black women, I'm told, are booking a fast from Malawi. Fast from Mount Malawi. Yeah. Will they tell us some more about it after the service? Yeah, yeah. Okay, guys. sir. Yes. That's emotional, isn't it? It was meant to be. Let's go and have a glass of wine now. Okay? Come on, then. Only one of them couldn't drink. We're going to drink as if we're drinking for them as well. As long as we don't get drunk, okay? Right. Yes. Yes. There's some books at the back here. Come and buy some books, please. Is that all?
won't know me, but I keep popping up occasionally. I see you a lot, but thank you. Won't you. Know me. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Pray for me. Pray for me. I hope you might be in contact a little bit with Al Barrett, who's my vicar yeah. at Hodge Hill. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. He's moving us along. So oh, okay. Just quickly saying hello. Oh. 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 You are wonderful. I love you. You are wonderful.